Uh, today's message is going to be in line with the series that we've been unpacking the last few weeks and we'll continue uh, to work through to the end of November, uh, entitled God Still Speaks. And it's this belief that we have that God is, God is speaking to us, trying to get our attention to see truth. If you're new to our church, uh, welcome here today. Uh, I hope I get a chance to meet you later. But what I want you to know even more uh, than, than that this is a friendly place and a hospitable place is what we believe. We believe this, that God hasn't abandoned us, that God is still speaking to us, that God is still pursuing us, that God is not done yet, that God loves us, and that this is good news. We don't say that from a place of hubris or a place of pride or arrogance. We actually say it from a place of humility, because if God is doing these things, if God is speaking, it will require the humble posture necessary in order to be changed by that truth. Truth should change how we live. When God speaks, he speaks to the heart so that we would experience change. What is that change? Freedom. Freedom from all of the forces within our society and within the world that want to control us. God, God created us with love and with intention and for the purpose of freedom. It's something we talk about a great deal here and we'll continue to talk about. We know that that freedom was broken, it was distorted and the forces of sin and the forces of evil and even the force of death entered into the world when in humanity's pride they rebelled against God's way. In that moment, in that moment of sin that Adam and Eve started and that we all participate in, we declared that our autonomy was more important than God's authority. And it's at that point that we allow the forces of this world to take control of us. God is gracious. God is good. He speaks of his love, and then he demonstrated his love, and we just sang about that. And one of my favorite songs of the power of the gospel, that Jesus died for sin but then rose again victorious over it. And in rising victorious, he declared his power, his authority over the forces that are at work in our world. I read this week basically a worldview statement that I think defines uh, society today and the generation. And it stands in contradiction to this. It's, it's basically this, I'm going to live my truth. Have you heard that? People saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my way. I'm going to find my truth, and I'm going to live according to that. That the greatest authority in my life is the truth that I discover, but I will be the one to define what that truth is. And I get it. When you're at war with the forces around you of, of evil and injustice, of conformity, that we, that we seem to battle, wondering where our uniqueness comes from, where our value comes from. Those forces can be so overwhelming that we have to make a stand. And we would say things like that, I'm going to live my truth. We as Christians feel compassion, not judgment, for those who feel that way, for those who say those things. As the the problem with asserting your authority as an expression of autonomy is very isolating and devastating behavior. That if you're going to live your truth, it's going to contradict someone else's. And you're going to find yourself alone, trying so hard to love yourself each and every day. This idea, this worldview was expressed very powerfully in the movie Frozen. Now, if you have kids or grandkids under the age of 12, I'm sure you've seen it, right? We experienced it this week, actually. Um, <laughs> when out of nowhere, everything froze. And it's the story of a young princess named Elsa who struggles with her unique ability, which is to touch something and have it freeze. She's trying to live her uniqueness out in a society that won't accept her for it. And she finally just says, I've had enough. And she runs away. And she runs away and builds herself an ice castle. And she sings 
a song that has become the anthem of our society today. Let it go. Let it go. She, she sings this song as she's building her ice castle, if I've got it correctly in my mind. And, and eventually, she, she does the right thing. She goes back to her home and, and rescues her sister. But, but the climax of the movie revolves around this song where she declares, Here I stand in my truth. She says this in that song. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. While she's living in an ice castle by herself. Disney's given an anti-gospel. They've given the gospel in other movies like Finding Nemo, but that's not for now. But um, <laughs> So... I guess what I'm saying is if you had a choice, just watch Finding Nemo. There's lots of gospel in there. And it's this self-deception that if I'm autonomous, then I'm truly free. And what it ends up being is lonely. Tim Keller in his book on preaching contrasts Elsa's Here I Stand with Luther's Here I Stand. This week we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Or some of us did. Luther stood before the Holy Roman Emperor knowing that if he didn't say the right thing to them, the right thing in their mind, they would take his life. And he said, here I stand on the biblical truth. The authority of God's word is what has set me free from the fear of death and the fear of you. Very famous sermon. And that was true freedom. He feared nothing. He feared not the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't fear for his life because God's word had demonstrated its authority in his life. And it's the authority of God's word on the Christian that demonstrates the authority of God for the Christian. And that's what we want to look at today. As we examine the power and the purpose of the Bible in our lives. This might be a reminder to many of you. Uh, it might be new to some of you. Uh, I'm going to let the Spirit dictate which one uh, that is for you. But, but I want you to know this, that what a Christian believes is that the, God's Word has the authority of God in his or her life. came across this graphic I wanted to share with you. It's Mark uh, Batterson, I believe. Uh, wisdom pyramid. This would be a truth pyramid, an authority pyramid. Just on all of the different messages uh, in our society and the avenues to get those messages to, to, to receive truth, there's, there's uh, five different ways. And, and, and they're all good, but some are better than others. The base of the pyramid is the Bible. It's our daily bread. It is the Word of God for the people of God. Okay? It transcends history. It is relevant. It matters to us. And so every message we get, either in our minds or from society or from one another or even from the pastor or the preacher in the church, has to line up with the message of Scripture. Okay? And it's the base. The Bible is the base. On top of that, it's the local church. Okay? That is, that is the, the gathering of God's people together under the authority of the word, proclaiming the word according to the truth that God has revealed in his word. The local church ascribes to a certain statement of faith, and this is time-tested theology that aligns itself with, with theologians throughout history. It's also expressed in various rhythms and in worship. It's wise people in physical place. It's connecting there. This week, we're going to talk about the Bible. We might even talk about it next week as well. We are going to talk about uh, the role that the local church plays in helping us understand God's Word and the authority of God's Word beyond just community, which Jordan talked about last week. Then there's nature and beauty. We can find truth outside, right? It means we have to go outside, but we can find outside. There's, there's order. There's purpose. I was thinking about that this week. The order got broken this week, right? Because what happened? The leaves didn't fall before the snow fell, and so now there's branches everywhere, right? That's not how it was supposed to be. 
I'm not going to get into a message on global warming because I know that that might empty this church. I just know there's something wrong. Anyways, then there's just art and beauty, truth communicated through music, through poetry, through painting. And we can find truth in those ways. They don't have the authority that Scripture has, but it doesn't mean we can't discover truth in that. Books. Books are good. Books are important. Now, we've got a whole bunch out in the foyer. Take as many as you want. Today's free book day at SCC, all right? And we've got a few that we're going to keep in a library that you can borrow, read, and bring back. Uh, one day, I would really like to set up a bookstore because we want to we wanna be able to share some of the books that we think uh, we all should be reading. Uh, this graphic says we should have more old books than new. We should have those great books. We should read a broad array of books. We should read books from authors that make us a little uncomfortable. Uh, we don't have to worry about about being so affected by untruth because we have the truth. So it's okay to expose ourselves to other ideas and other worldviews. In fact, it's important if we want to dialogue with the culture within, within where we live. Then there's the internet, okay? Now, what happens when we have a question about something in this society, in our day and age? We Google it. I have a question about Tithing. Should a Christian tithe? Do we go to the Bible? Uh, we Google it to find what some guy somewhere, you know, reading out of his King James Bible says about tithing. When we have this, where we could look it up. Same thing about salvation or the legitimacy of Christ or the resurrection of Jesus. There is some really, really great stuff on the internet, but it's supplemental. Okay? It's supplemental. We have exposure to all of this information. But if we don't put it in the right place in our lives, it will feed that sense, that desire for autonomy. If I can find some random dude on the internet who says what I want to hear, then what I believe is confirmed by someone. Okay? And that's dangerous. And then finally, social media, which you need to learn to live without. Today, today we see and want to believe that Scripture is the authority for the Christian, for the Christian, of the Christian and for the Christian. We believe that in the Bible is truth and that this truth is for everyone. And when something is true, it has an inherent authority. In fact, it's inescapable, that authority. We think of authority in a reactionary way, but, but I want to think of it more in maybe a scientific way today. There was a time in history where where scientists believed that the sun rotated around the earth. Why did they believe that? Because they saw the sun rotating around the earth. When Galileo came along, he discovered that actually the earth rotates around the sun. And science has led us to believe now that, that it's gravity that pulls the earth around the sun. I ask you the question, Where's the authority lie in that, in that situation? The authority is expressed in the force of gravity pulling the earth around the sun. And in the same way, in the same way, our lives circle God, are centered on Christ, are centered on the gospel. And it's Scripture's authority that allows us to live that way. Does that make sense? So first off, I just want us to kind of put aside our emotional reaction to authority and just see that this is the way it's supposed to be. Scripture validates our faith. It, it ensures our faith. It tells us that our faith has legitimacy. Scripture is also the voice of God. And as much as it validates our faith, it's the expression of our faith, that it's the power of God in our lives that as we open up the word, we expect to hear the voice of God. And so the Bible is something we emotionally engage with. It's not something that we simply put in the intellectual box, but it's something we look for God to use to get into our heart. Psalm 119 is a very... I don't know, maybe self-serving passage of Scripture in that it talks about the legitimacy of Scripture, but, but it's written as poetry. It's written as, 
as by one who has experienced the profound effect of Scripture's power in his life. Psalm 119, verse 25, My soul clings to dust. Give me life according to your word. Here, he's praying. He's praying and inviting God into his physical reality that he might have life in his spiritual reality. It says in verse 28, My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. You see, it's the word of God in our lives that allows us to deal with our lives themselves. And this is, this is good news. This is our expectation. If it's good news, it requires the humility to enter into it, but also the intention to enter into it. Scripture validates our faith. It is a living book. It is a book that is profoundly meaningful. I don't want to get into a lot of the apologetics around the validity of Scripture, but I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, one of the things that is difficult when reading our Bible is finding the right translation, right? Right? There's all of these different translations. The first English translation was the King James Version. Since that day, there have been new translations published. Now, this actually is a testament to the validity of Scripture in that all of those translations carry the same message. The language may have changed, but the message has remained the same. So when we're looking for a translation, we're looking for one that is readable, that challenges us, but that we're comfortable with. We're looking for the message in there to line up with historical tradition and line up with the original Greek or Hebrew that it was written in. There is one translation that, that has stood out from all of the other translations, and it stood out because it's decided that Jesus isn't God. It's called the New World Translation, and it's the scripture of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? But they've changed the message of scripture. There's hundreds of other translations that essentially say the same thing, but they're standing over here and just saying, no, our guy who translated it did it right. I think that kind of points to the validity of Scripture. The Bible itself points to its own validity, but, but in some interesting ways. The Bible is made up of 66 books and two parts. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible is not an encyclopedia, it's not a dictionary. When you open up a dictionary or encyclopedia, you know exactly uh, what it is saying wherever you open it up. The scriptures aren't like that. We need the Old and the New Testament together to point us to the truth of the whole Bible. The Bible is essentially a story. It's a story of God's love for a broken humanity and its hero, Jesus. The Old Testament tells us that. And the New Testament tells us that. The Old Testament is stories of prophets and priests and kings. It has prophecy and poetry and history in it. It speaks of, of God's plan for all of humanity to bless the world by blessing this one nation, that these people that he called to himself and by himself, that he revealed himself to, and that he was going to save the whole world through them, through a Messiah that was to come. And until that Messiah was to come, God would speak through prophets, through priests, and through kings. And that Messiah did come, and Jesus fulfilled the Scripture by being the prophet, the priest, and the king. The validity and the authority of the Old Testament is found in Christ's fulfillment of it as prophet, priest, and king. The New Testament, the New Testament contains the history of Jesus and the early church and was written by apostles. Now, what makes someone an apostle? Though they saw the resurrected Jesus in bodily form. That's what made someone an apostle. Apostle, And these apostles, who were so close to Jesus that they'd heard his words and been affected so deeply by him, wrote scripture. And their scripture is authoritative. The validity and the authority of the New Testament is that it was written by those who saw the power of God demonstrated in the words, life, life and death of Jesus Christ, and that that was confirmed by the other apostles. So what that means is that the writings of the New Testament and the authority that comes with it and the validity that comes with it 
is based on the apostles who saw Jesus in resurrected form, who died many, many years ago, right? And it was then that the New Testament canon was finished. It closed. That means we don't add to Scripture. And that's where we talk about our Mormon brothers and sisters, friends, who have added to the Scripture. We would say, no, we've got it all right here. We've got the authority right here. I guess what I want you to take away from that is the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Christ. It's all about what God is doing in the world through giving us himself through Jesus, who was God, becoming one of us in order to die for our sin and demonstrate the power of God in the resurrection. And when we read the scriptures, we're looking for Jesus. We're looking for the words of Jesus. Peter said a lot of dumb things. He was one of the apostles. And he was often opening his mouth and inserting his foot. But on one moment, actually a number of moments, he got it right. Jesus, Jesus looks at him one day as the people were leaving because truth is confrontational. And as Jesus was teaching truth about God's word and truth about himself, the people were leaving. And he looks at Jesus and he, or at Peter and he says, do you want to leave? And what does Peter say? Where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus used scripture to demonstrate and to speak the voice of God. There are many ways God speaks. God speaks through desires. God speaks through doors. God speaks through dreams. God speaks through promptings and people and pain. But those are all secondary languages. And it's in those ways that God is whispering to us. But God is yelling at us. God is trying to get our attention about Christ and about the gospel. He is preaching to us about Jesus. Luke 4 and Matthew 5. You want to take a look there? Just two examples of this in Jesus' life, and then I'm going to give you a third in a moment. Luke 4, verse 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Here's the example of Jesus taking the Old Testament and using it to point at himself. And what's the message? That one was coming upon whom the Spirit of the Lord would be who would proclaim good news to the poor, who would set the captives free, who would give sight to the blind and and release the prisoners, those who are oppressed, the one who would bring freedom. Jesus goes to church on a Saturday. They give him the scripture. He opens it up. And in that moment, they heard God speak through the reading of scripture. The hearer heard God speak through the reading of Scripture, and it's the same in our approach. When we open it up, this is what God is trying to get us to understand, that Jesus came as the one filled with the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind. Jesus came to not just preach freedom, but to give freedom. And he uses the Scripture to do that. Matthew 5. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, the problem in that day was that the people were treating the Bible like a rule book. That they, their morality and their holiness 
and was attached to it. And Jesus said, the words in and of themselves aren't going to save you. I will save you. He calls them to a greater righteousness. He's saying, you need to be more righteous than all of those men who are doing their very best to fulfill every one of the single laws. Your righteousness needs to exceed that. How? How are we supposed to do that? How can anyone do that? And Jesus' message was this. I didn't come to abolish that. I came to fulfill what it couldn't do. I came to give you a righteousness to liberate you from the slavery to the law, from this belief that God is a God who is only judging and is not loving. I came you to deliver you from that. And what Christianity teaches, what the Bible teaches, is that when we place our faith in Jesus, we're given his righteousness. So the Bible is not a rule book. The law, all of this stuff here, points to Christ because we can't fulfill it on our own. We need Jesus. We need Jesus in us to call us righteous. And that, my friends, is freedom. It's freedom. It's blessing. And that's the power of Scripture. The New Testament is the old concealed, and the Old Testament is the new revealed. Augustine said that. And that's true for us. What we have here is profound, is powerful. It has authority over our lives. It tells us what is true. Just as like we can't debate whether gravity is true, we can't debate the content of the key message in this to be true. It's not up for debate. And when we can embrace that, the authority of God's word on us, we will see the authority of God's word for us. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, John 8, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8, 31, 32. I'm going to read it again. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. To be a disciple is to be under the authority of Christ, as expressed in his word. And to be a disciple is to be free. Free from what? The powers, the forces that are at work in our world. Sin, Satan, and death. Injustice, evil. We are set free by the word of God, which continually reminds us about the power of Jesus. Are you with me? This is what Jesus lived out. He knew the authority of Scripture for the believer. I alluded a couple weeks ago, maybe you were here, to Jesus going out into the wilderness after his baptism. That after he was baptized, after God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, after the spirit had descended on him and indwelled him, that he went to the desert. He went to the wilderness. Why? Because it was the place of temptation. It was the place of failure. He alludes to that time in Israel's history when they were in the desert and they had the manifest presence of God that they could see and the manifest voice of God that they could hear and they still fell to temptation. They still believed Satan's lies. So Jesus, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, goes to that place and shows us the power of God's word and the Holy Spirit in our lives. Satan tempts him three times. The first temptation Take these stones and turn them to bread. Why did that matter? Jesus was hungry. He was a human. He had been fasting for 40 days. And Satan comes to him and says, why don't you just turn this this rock to bread? If you're the son of God, then prove it. What does Jesus say? He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. He overcomes the temptation, the second temptation. The second temptation Satan gives to him is that he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you bow down to me, I will give you all of this. What does Jesus say? It says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The final temptation, Satan brought Jesus up onto the top of the temple and said, throw yourself off of here. And doesn't the scripture say the angels will pick you up? That was a big deal because there were lots of people around the temple. And if Jesus was at the top of the temple and threw himself off and angels caught him, then they would believe that he was God. They would believe he was the Messiah. 
But you know what wouldn't happen to hap- have to happen if that was the case? He wouldn't have to go to the cross. That if Jesus showed himself magically by superpowers, if you will, that he was the Messiah, then people would believe and he could avoid the cross. But that wouldn't save people. So the temptation was to avoid pain at all costs. And what does Jesus say? He says, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Where's the power? The power is in those first three words in Luke 4 each time Jesus is tempted, where he says, it is written. It is written. It is said. While the Bible exists in the words, the power of darkness are under profound threat. When Jesus came under satanic attack, he didn't break out his superpowers. He quoted the Bible and he won. So can we. Jesus spoke the voice of God, the word of God, and Satan fled. Satan ran. Satan couldn't handle it. Jesus had the Holy Spirit inside of him, and he knew God's word. What's different in our humanity? If we are Christians, if we believe that Jesus is God who died for our sin and placed our faith in him for salvation and for new life, the Spirit lives inside of us. And then we've got the Bible. So we read the Bible, the Spirit moves in our heart, and it becomes the power of God on our behalf. It is written, it is written, and Satan fled. Jesus was trusting the word of God, and Satan left him. Jesus was speaking the voice of God, and Satan left him. I mean, isn't that true freedom? Isn't that what we want the voice of God to do in our lives, is to deliver us from the powers at work against us? Isn't that what we need God's voice to do, is to set us free? Unless you live in the truth of his word, your world truly warps. Ann Voskamp said that in one of her books, and it is true. I came across an article that I think is a great example of this, and, and I'd like to read it to you. It's a little long, but... Uh, The title of it caught me, and I'm sure it'll catch you. The title of it is, I Married a Same-Sex Attracted Man, and I'm Blessed. It was written by Jacqueline Parrish, and you can find it on uh, thegospelcoalition.org. This is what she writes. My husband struggles with same-sex attraction. Like me, Sam came into this world with an innate and insatiable desire for things that bring death. Like me, he came into our marriage bearing the weight of pain he didn't ask for, and the scars of choices he can't change. And like me, he has chosen to trust Christ, not to make him heterosexual, but to make him holy. When people aren't stunned into silence by that revelation, they uh, they often ask us, so what's that like? And I can honestly answer that it is difficult. It is lonely, it is painful, it is scary. But without his past sin and present struggle, Sam and I might have plodded through our entire life and missed the miracle. But because of my husband's struggle with same-sex attraction, we get to see our marriage for what every Christian marriage is, a wondrous, dangerous, glorious, and thunderous testimony to the greatness of God's redemption and the goodness of his plan. Here's where it gets relevant for us. When I was in second grade, I bet my eternity on Scripture. When I, bar- when I married Sam, I bet my life on it. The eight-year-old girl in the baptistry anteed up as best she could, but the woman at the altar was all in, and she knew it. If I was wrong, it wouldn't cost me down the line after death. It would cost me today, tomorrow, and every day for the rest of my life. Suddenly, Scripture wasn't something I could devote the odd half hour to. I had to build my life on it, and I needed it beneath my feet at every moment. Psalm 19, for example makes real visceral sense to me now. Previously, the 176 verses waxing eloquent on the beauties of the law had always seemed a bit much, to be honest. Now, I know that 176 verses couldn't possibly express a fraction of the Bible's incalculable worth. When the scars of past sin start screaming, and yes, they do, Sam and I cling to the Scripture and weep together before our Savior. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. And at the end of each day, both good and bad, we can echo the psalmist, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Because of Sam's testimony, we're fully convinced that God's word is essential and that it is sufficient. Until Christ calls us home, we will never stop needing it, and it will always be enough. Two things stand out to me. First of all, the gospel perspective of that. 
the wonderful gospel perspective of that. Two broken people seeking God together. How? Scripture. That line where she says, Scripture is not something I can just devote the odd half hour to, resonated with me. Because that's kind of how we treat it. We are rich in the Word. In this day and this age, we have Bibles of all shapes and sizes. We have resources like concordances and commentaries to help us understand it. We are able to read, which is more than than most could say in the previous 2,000 years. God has given us a blessing with this scripture so that we would experience the blessing of the freedom the freedom he has granted us in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. So I guess the next thing to be said is we should probably read it, right? We should probably read it with expectation. I'm going to finish with this, just a couple minutes, of practical ways to read your Bible and to hear the voice of God. Not that it's a guarantee, but it's a good place to start. First of all, you might be asking yourself, what should I read? That's a great question. Pick a book of the Bible to study through. If you're a new Christian or you're newer to the faith or you've forgotten your faith, just start with the book of John. Every Bible has a table of contents at the very beginning. Use it and it will help you find John. And just read about Jesus. And whenever you see truth, underline it with a pen. Circle it. You can follow a plan. Uh, We've been... Uh, Many of us on staff have been using He Reads Truth or She Reads Truth, which are apps that you can put on your phone or on your tablet. And there's plans in there. You can read them online as well. Uh, They've got some really cool wallpapers, not actual wallpaper, but wallpaper that you can put on your phone that are photos and scripture, that every time you turn on your phone, there's a reminder, uh, a promise of God's word. But there's some really great plans in there, and they're really well done. Uh, and I would love for you to try it out and, uh, and let me know what you think. You can join a Bible study. Generally, we as a church, we follow through a book. We just finished Genesis, 75 weeks in Genesis. Some of you read the chapter ahead uh, in preparation for that coming Sunday's message, and I think that's a great way of doing it. In January, we're going to start the book of Philippians. We'll be doing that for six months, verse by verse through Philippians, and I'd love for you to read along. Our life groups... If you join one of those, discuss the scripture that was read in the Sunday service. That's a good way of doing it as well. How should you read it? Just a couple of things here. Uh, what you got to, when we sit down, we say, what is the Bible saying? What are the promises and truths that are present in this passage? You may even want to write it out in your own words. After that, you ask, what is God saying to me? That if this is true, then what is God trying to say to me? Maybe it's, maybe it's a word of affirmation, a word of his love. Maybe it's a word of conviction, uh, a word of of exposing a sin or a a particular idol in your life. What is God saying to me? The next one is very, very important. I don't think you can read it on the screen, but it says, what is my resistance to this truth? What is my resistance? The human heart will never fully want all of God's word and all of God's truth in it until we're totally sanctified and redeemed. And so we are going to resist it. But when we call out the resistance, we can then embrace the truth. Like Jesus, when he was out in the wilderness, and Satan comes to him and says to him, if you're hungry, why don't you turn this rock to bread? He's like, I am hungry. I don't know what was going on in his mind. I am hungry. I deserve a piece of bread. Bread isn't that much. Bread isn't a lot. I deserve that. Until Scripture comes in and challenges that and allows him to experience the power of God. How will I believe it? How will I demonstrate my trust in my actions? I think those are just some easy questions, especially if you're new to Bible reading, to just sit down and do, to have your pen. Uh, just write that down on a piece of paper uh, and, uh, and enter into Scripture that way. Some people have asked me, is listening to the Bible okay? And I think, you know, it's true that some of us struggle with reading. Some of us have, have learning disabilities that are, that are hard, that make reading difficult. It's okay to listen to the Bible, but here's what I would say. Don't listen to it while you're doing something else, okay? Don't say, I'm going to listen to God's Word while I'm commuting. That's okay. 
until Buddy from Alberta cuts you off, right? And the scripture says, don't be angry about anything, and you're like, nope. I don't know why they can't make the corners a little faster, but I guess they drive straight lots. That's for my friends from Alberta here today. It's okay to listen to it. I would suggest if you're going to listen to it, uh, listen to it and read it at the same time. That that would probably be the best thing. Try to read it, but listen to it if that helps. A couple other tips. Pray. Pray this every time you enter into it with humility. Open my eyes to see spiritual reality. Open my ears to hear your voice because reading scripture is inherently spiritual. Read more than a few verses at a time. Understand the author's original intent and try to find those transcendent truths. Use a study Bible, okay? Uh, study Bibles uh, have little uh, sections that, that tell you what the author is saying uh, in a way that, that might be easier to understand. It also gives background on each book. It's worth spending some money on a study Bible. I'm amazed that we'll buy a $100 pair of jeans, but we'll spend $28 on a Bible, okay? Spend some money on your Bible, have a good one, um, and that's okay. Uh, finally, read it in community. Invite others into it. Don't seek and destroy. Don't sit down with your Bible and just flip open to Second Chronicles, point your finger, and try to figure that out. Don't do that. Have a plan. Don't be discouraged. Persevere if God doesn't, even if God doesn't speak to you in a very clear way that day. Continue to persevere. It will come. It will come. I promise you that. Meditate on it. Think on it. Uh, but don't be discouraged. Don't be proud. There's no winning at Bible reading, okay? There's no winning at Bible reading. I know in my life when I come into crowds like churches and I'm insecure, I'll look around and judge everybody else by this. I bet they didn't read their Bible as much as I did this week, <laughs> right? It's my insecurity that exposes my sin and my judgment. Don't be proud about it. Anybody can do it. Just got to find a half hour. That doesn't make you special. It just, it's good. And heed the whole counsel. Don't pick and choose what you don't like, okay? Don't use it, don't use it to confirm your own bias. That came up last year when we were discussing doing refugee ministry. And a few people had some strong opinions on whether or not we should be doing refugee ministry, whether we should be inviting people from other countries to come and live here. Uh, and I said to a few of them, well, we better take the Good Samaritan out of our Bible then. We better take all the passages where God expresses his love and desire for the sojourner out of our Bible. We don't get to pick and choose, okay? We get to study it together. We heed the whole counsel, and we see it as an incredible gift. We can read, and we have God's word, and we have God's spirit, that's how we hear God's voice. We live that out by faith. We live that out by giving our worship to Jesus, by demonstrating our thanksgiving to God as revealed in the scripture that he loved us enough to give us his son to pay the penalty for our sin that we might have new life and we might have freedom. We don't worship the book itself. We worship the God who is revealed in the book something today we're going to put into action. And it's our custom on the first Sunday of every, of every month to participate in communion. And so as the band's singing, I'm going to invite all of those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus for salvation to come forward and to take a piece of bread and to take a cup and to take it back to your seat. And when you eat the bread, you are declaring that Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus is the one through whom we have wholeness. And that when you drink the cup, you're trusting in Jesus' uh, sacrifice to remove your sins. That's what scripture testifies to, but then we get the chance to live it out here. Jesus, after he had had the very first communion with his disciples on the night before he was crucified, prayed a prayer. And the prayer is found in John 17, and it's a wonderful prayer. And in it, he says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The sanctification takes place when we place our faith in Jesus and him alone for salvation and trust him and him only. That's what we're doing. That's what we're demonstrating by taking communion. And we're 
sanctified, being sanctified by God's word when we're placing our faith in him in this way. And this is just a public declaration of that. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads to pray with me. The band's going to come up. We're going to take communion together afterwards. And the ushers are going to pass around offering baskets. This is for our benevolent offering. And for those of you who are prepared to give so that we can help others, you can give at that time. Uh, but right now, let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, first of all, uh, thank you for not abandoning us. Thank you for continuing to speak to us. Thank you for the scripture which testifies about you and about your grace and about the power of God at work in us so that we can be victorious over the forces against us in the world. Lord Jesus, we come today humble to this table, knowing that we don't take communion to show our worth to you, to prove our devotion to you, but we take it simply because we needed you when we knew we needed salvation and we continue to need you as we try to live the resurrected life of a disciple. We come humbly and even with a sense of brokenness to this place. But we lift our eyes to you. And as we remember your sacrifice for us, might you remind us that it was your joy to make it possible for us to be saved. That it was the joy that was set before you that allowed you to endure the shame of the cross. Might that be where our rest comes from today. Might that be where our peace comes from today. Might that be where our hope comes from today. So as we participate in communion, as we sing of your goodness, might we feel it. Sanctify us in your truth. You, Lord Jesus, the word are the truth. And you bring light, and in your light is life to all men. We rest in that this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.